So I want to continue with WKB theory, and actually I'm going to walk through a number of examples that are sort of practical in nature and sort of highlight where you might use WKB uh, from a, you know, just a, a really practical perspective on, uh, on thinking about doing asymptotics. In other words, looking at asymptotic behavior of solutions of different differential equations, whether it be uh, boundary value problems, initial value problems, where you can use this WKB architecture, which is really geared towards thinking about an amplitude phase decomposition where the phase, in other words, the, is, is very rapid. Okay, and so this is what we're going to do, and then I also want to talk about this concept of turning points, which is where behaviors change, and this comes up quite a bit where WKB theory is a really nice tool for doing some asymptotics, understanding transition regions around turning points, and this often comes up in quantum mechanics, uh, behaviors inside a potential well to behaviors outside a potential well, and what happens right at that boundary and interface. So I want to remind people that WKB theory is really about solving uh, these problems that, uh, that are singular in nature with a high amplitude. I'm going to consider this example for a moment, which is uxx equals xu, which is called the area equation. And what I really want to understand is the asymptotic behavior of the area equation. Another way to think about this is you have, this is something like Schrodinger, but uh, what you have here is a potential that's linear. So you have... Uh, you know, at x equals zero, right, so you, this is a line, and so you kind of are interested in what happens with this, with this linear potential and specifically around x equals to zero, okay? There's no small parameter in it at this point, but let's, let's go ahead and start playing around and just doing a formal expansion. In particular, epsilon in this case is one. Remember what we solved in the previous lecture was epsilon squared uxx is equals q of x u. So it's of that form with q of x equals x and epsilon equals to one. Okay, so formally epsilon isn't small at this point. But we're going to still going to try this technique here. Okay, so if you remember from the last lecture, I'm just going to write this down. When we do this expansion, we're going to plug in the WKB expansion, and it's e to the s of x over epsilon, and we expand s of x in a regular perturbation theory, and as you pull this into your governing equation, here are the hierarchy of corrections that you get. Here's the equation for the s naught leading order equation, the icono equation, S1, which is the transport, S2, S3, and so forth. So I just show you the first four. And now what we're going to do is take this q of x, which specifically takes this form here, which is x, and we're going to plug it in to that hierarchy and see what we get. So here's what we have. So we have this here, and we're going to plug it in, and then when you actually go compute this with q of x being x, this is what you get. So what you get here, right, is first order solution is x to the 3 halves, and you get s1, which is a log x, and S2 is x and negative 3 halves, and then you, you can keep going if you'd like, but there you go. This is such a simple uh, Q of x that you can actually compute these out very nicely, and then your solution behavior is given by the following. Your two solutions are x to the negative fourth and this exponent here. Okay? So what this gives you is the behavior, the asymptotic behavior of these Aries functions that are actually really important in characterizing the turning point behaviors in quantum mechanics. So oftentimes a potential right at the boundary where you're inside and outside the potential, you assume that the potential looks like a, is, a, is approximated by this potential x. In other words, what happens near this point and outside of one regime, this thing starts to decay, but it decays and it has a uh, x to the negative one fourth amplitude in front in addition to the exponential decay, which goes like x to the three halves. So it tells you something about the fundamental nature of the solutions near that point. Okay, a second example I want to give uh, is what's called the parabolic cylinder functions. And here is the differential equation that this parabolic cylinder, cylinder functions satisfy. So you have a 1 fourth x squared, so it's like a harmonic potential. For those of you who come from quantum mechanics background, you'll notice that the harmonic potential is usually an x squared potential, so you have that. But you also have this mu, nu minus one half, okay? So these constants in there. And then so what you'd like to do is understand the, par uh, I can write down solutions to this as parabolic functions, which are just a representation of some Taylor series of expansion of behaviors in, in one way. And so what I'd really like to do is understand the leading order asymptotics of these parabolic solutions that I have that come out of here. 
Okay, so let's go about doing it. So in this case, again, epsilon is 1. Q of x is equal to this x fourth, x squared over 4 minus nu minus a half. And so I'm going to plug that into my hierarchy and compute the contributions. So here's what you get. At S0, this is your leading order solution to your iconal equation. Here's your solution to your transport equation. Remember, the transport equation is e to this power of log, so the log's going to go away, and it's going to give you an amplitude term, which goes like x to negative 1 half. So your solutions to this parabolic cylinder equation, okay, uh, an asymptotic approximation to it is given right by here. Two in linear independent solutions. Here's a C plus, which is some constant. X to the minus nu minus one to times a Gaussian. Okay, or actually, there's no minus sign here, so it's x e to the x squared. And then here, C minus x nu, and then that is the ga uh, Gaussian e to the minus x squared over four. So these are your two linearly independent solutions, and you get different behaviors. One that's growing like e to the x squared, one that's decaying like e to minus x squared, but also they have a x behavior out in front, uh, which, which also modifies what that growth looks like. So that's the asymptotics of these parabolic cylinder functions. And again, these are typically things that you'd have to just plot, but asymptotics just gives you this representation which is very understandable in these regimes. A third example I want to give <coughs> is when you have a little bit more exotic Q of x. In this case, it's log x over x squared. And so one of the things that we want to consider here is what we've been getting away with so far is saying, well, I can pretty much get my solution with just the iconal and the transport contributions. And what I want to highlight here is actually we have to go to higher order in order to get not only the truncate the perturbation theory so that the term we truncate with is actually small, right? So you don't want to truncate a perturbation theory when the term you're truncating is big still, right? You want to make sure you have a small term you're truncating. And in fact, if you just truncate at the iconal on the transport equation for this problem in particular, you're not truncating a small term. So you need to go to next order correction to make sure that happens. So again, you can take this Q of x, if epsilon's 1, throw it in. Here is your hierarchy of equations. We've just gone up to S2. No need to get S, go S3 in this case. So I can put these all in. I can actually compute them, right? So I have S0, that's the iconal. S1 is given by here. Transport and S2 is this here. And you can see I can actually explicitly do these integrals. I just get these interesting functions like a log of a log, okay? And or here a log uh, to the minus 2 power, so forth. So the, the problem with going to those orders is, is actually that it's not small. So actually, I am forced to go to the next order, and I have to compute the S3 in order for me to guarantee that the next term is small. And so if you look at the S3 term, these, in fact, are going to be small contributions. And so I need to not just go S0, S1, S2. I have to go all the way to S3 so that when I do this approximation, which is S0 plus epsilon S1 plus epsilon S2 plus epsilon S S3, I want to make sure that when I truncate, the term I truncate is small. And I'm finally guaranteed to have that once I'm at the S3 term. Okay? And this is partly due to that log term. The log creates some interesting asymptotics that requires you to do this and go to higher terms. I want to go to another example, and again, this comes out of quantum mechanics, and so this is a, a, a high usage area. WKB theory shows up in quantum quite a bit. In fact, Wenzel, Brillion, and Kramer, the, the, the WKB people, came out of that community in thinking about approximating the eigenfunctions in, in certain uh, potentials when you're, you're, you're well, well away from the bottom of the potential. So in other words, some of the higher eigenvalues. And so the idea here is that you have this very rapid oscillations for those eigenvalues. And so what we have is this equation here where the Q of X is now like your potential. And so this is like your Schrodinger equation and you're going to try to approximate some band of, uh, of atomic energy levels that are very far away from the ground state. And so this is where a lot of the WKB architecture was actually motivated to come from. And so here, if you use that expansion there, you can actually go ahead and solve for the iconic, 
iconal transport from some potential Q of X. Here are the contributions, which allow you to construct the solution, which is given by here. Now notice one thing here. Because I've taken the sign of this thing here as a positive number, and when I take the square root of this here, negative EQ, this is going to be complex number. It's going to be like sines and cosines, so oscillations. Okay? And so when you get these solutions out, here's what they look like. Here's one of the solutions. Sine of square root E times the integral of Q of X. Cosine of this thing. So notice that it's, E is big. These are very fast oscillations. And it's exactly what you have in quantum mechanics and electrodynamics. Some of these eigenfunctions and eigenvalues correspond to very rapid oscillatory behavior. And what you'd like to do is approximate them asymptotically. And so the WKB expansion here I'm showing you does exactly that. So one way to think about it is I'm looking at when in the quantum mechanics scenario, this energy E is going to be big. So if I divide by E, it's like having an epsilon squared in front of this UXX. That's exactly the asymptotic limit. So the large E limit, which means fast oscillations here because you can see it's sine of square root E. So that's a frequency. And so if E is large, it's going to be a very fast oscillation. So here we're going to apply boundary conditions. I'm fi finally applying some boundary conditions. I'm going to say it's pin at 0 and pi uh, to be 0. So I have uh, basically a particle in the box. Uh, and so when you do that, you can actually go ahead and compute what your eigenfunctions and eigenvalues look like. And here's what they are. So you can actually imply, impose your boundary conditions, and you get these constraints. You can actually show that the energy levels are quantized. So the E of n, these eigenvalues, and we've talked about quantization of eigenvalues previously when we were looking at linear operators. Now you're in a bounded domain, and you have certain eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. And here that is what they are. The eigenvalues are here, n pi over the integral of q of x, square root of q of x squared. And your eigenfunctions are here. u of x is, look at this, q to the minus fourth sine of square root e, and that should be actually e to n, integral of q of x. So that's what you have for your solution type for this equation. So now all I have to do is figure out, like, well, if I give you a specific potential, q of x, then you could compute this. So in fact, let's go ahead and do that. Let's take this as my potential, x plus pi to the fourth power. Okay, So this is some kind of quartic potential. Okay, And so I'm going to put that in to my governing equations there, the q of x. And here's what I find. Here are what the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions are doing. I can actually explicitly compute these. And so this is giving you some kind of representation of the energy levels in a quantum mechanical system. And by the way, that same kind of representation is also comes from electrodynamics when you have uh, waveguides. And waveguides trap different propagating modes. And these are what are called their wave numbers here. And so these are, these are the kind of approximations you're getting uh, through asymptotics. So for E large, this is a very nice representation of the solution. Okay, versus I don't have a closed form solution. If I just put this Q of X in, I don't have a closed form solution except in this large E limit in which I can write down very simple expressions. So a lot of times when we were looking at physics problems in the past, we could simply say, yes, there's a computational solution to this. But if I want a really simple analytic representation that's highly interpretable, I need to do asymptotics. And this is exactly what the asymptotics and perturbation do here, is they give you a way to get very simple representations of what's going on in the system. And here they are for that quantum mechanical system. So that's the power of what WKB does, right? Is this amplitude phase decomposition. It's an it's a asymptotic perturbation method that allows you to pull apart information, get interpretable information out of these systems in a very efficient manner um, by doing, it for certain types of problems, where you do this amplitude phase decomposition. OK, that's it for WKB theory.